put a tourniquet on his leg. I'm 99% sure his leg is mostly stopped bleeding, but we're in the water, so blood is now super thin, not super sure yet, but he got hit by a shark. Sharks have big mouths. I need to check the rest of his body and make sure I know what's going on. So at that point, we do what's called a blood sweep. Do you mind if I get touchy-feely with you? Sure. Up. Yeah, if you don't mind. So, take his clothes off, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to actually take his clothes off, but, and you can actually do this. Actually, a wetsuit won't work with this. So you will need to remove the part of the wetsuit that is not in the, in the affected area. So say he was bitten in the leg, I would probably cut his suit open down, down to about his waist. And just like cut, if it's a two-piece, I'll cut the top open so it's now a jacket. And then I'm going to start with his head, and I'm just going to start feeling and checking my hands like this. And hopefully I've taken my gloves off so I can actually see blood. And I'm feeling all the way down his body because a lot of the time you won't notice where like the blood is coming from. Or if somebody got penetrated on the front part of their body, you're not sure if it went through the back because he kind of tried to pull on it or something. So you're just going down his body and you're actually pushing and feeling. And a lot of the times you'll be able to feel like a small opening if there's, I mean, a gunshot hole you would feel. I'm not trying to get super, you know, towards that, that realm. But you're, you're looking and feeling for like shark lacerations. So the thing is, like an AK-47 bullet, when it goes into you, after it goes into you, you're not really gonna see a hole 90% of the time. It's gonna like, your skin's gonna close back up on the front side, be a big ass hole on the back side, but a shark tooth is even less, it has less diameter going you know, the, the, the short way than AK-47 bullets, so you might not see lacerations. So that's why you need to get in there and feel. Did you have something to add? Uh, I was trying to hear. No, I was just gonna, this is, we have them in pro there, so the club's gonna get a, 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 some appetizers for each table and a pitcher of beer. So I'll get some of that. And if you want to get something else, uh, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, so with that, make sure we're getting in and we're actually checking and feeling and trying to find holes in the skin. Okay? And we're gonna do that from head to toe. You sit back down. So that's what I've done after I've put a tourniquet on this guy. I'm looking for any other problems. If I haven't found any problems, I'm going to move to the next step of March, which is airway. So he just got bit. I know he only got bit, but I still need to make sure he's still breathing. Okay, I'm going to open his mouth, make sure that he's breathing. I can listen and I can hear his breath. If not, I'm going to open his mouth. I'm going to pull his jaw forward and see if there's any obstructions in it. It's about as detailed as we need to get in this. Um, if he got bit and then you think he had some kind of blackout or was in the water too long, you can remove the mask, and this is as far as I'll get into the FII stuff, you'll remove the mask and you're going to blow on his cheek where the mask was because you have sensory receptors in there that when they feel that cold air, they might just wake you up. You're going to blow, you're going to tap, and you're going to say his name. Okay, so that's what, if you guys go to the FII courses, that's what they'll teach you about how to recover an unconscious victim. Uh, so just keep that in your memory bank and definitely, I'd, I'd really recommend going to one of those courses because there's a lot more to it than that. You're gonna give it a maximum of two rescue breaths at this time. Later, if you need to start doing CPR, you can start worrying about that, but a maximum of two rescue breaths. Your only real goal here is to cancel a laryngeal spasm. If he was down and actually blacked out, your throat is gonna close to protect you. As long as you have air in your lungs, when you black out, your throat's gonna close to protect you from inhaling water, and it's gonna stay closed until you wake up or you get positive air pushing to unlock that laryngeal spasm. And then basically that's all you're gonna deal with with airway. Okay, so respiration. This is our last real thing on here and then we'll actually show how to put some of this stuff on. Um, like I said, I think I have some better depictions of it. Okay, so if you had any kind of penetrating injury, basically from your belly button to your neckline, you have a risk of penetrating that sealed container that I was talking about, about your chest being, all right? So if I have a sealed container and it's actuated by my diaphragm being pumped, and I have a hole in that container, my pump doesn't work anymore, okay? So if I have a hole in this side, what will happen, what can happen eventually is what's called a tension hematorax. And that's where when you breathe in, and your diaphragm goes down, you have a hole, so it sucks air in, because your lungs penetrated, this hole's penetrated, so it sucks air in, but you've got like more tissue on the inside, when the diaphragm goes back up, that air can't go out. And as that goes on for a long period of time, this lung can start slowly collapsing and you can start losing the ability to breathe through that lung. So what we can do at our level to stop that is just put anything on it that we call an occlusive dressing. You can put like, so this is an occlusive dressing. 
but the package itself is an inclusive resin. It's literally any kind of plastic or non-air permeable substance that you're just gonna take down on the guy's chest. So anytime there's any kind of laceration to the chest, if you don't see a lot of blood coming out of it, your little blood's okay. Put it, immediately just put a piece of plastic on it and check for an exit wound on the back if the spear went all the way through. Um, there's gonna be a spear there, most likely. Don't remove the spear. Just take this, we'll open this guy right now. Demo how to use it in a little bit. So all these are is like two pieces of super, super sticky, sticky uh, non-air permeable plastic. They come off and it's like that really nasty crap you put on in the hospital that doesn't want to come off your body for like three weeks. Tagaderm. Yeah, so whoever has the hairiest chest should demonstrate this for us. <laughs> <laughs> if I was going to apply this to somebody who had a spear through them, I would simply cut I would just cut down it to about the middle. Okay, so that would open it up so that I could put it on and then wrap it around the spear and then put it down and still create an airtight seal. And then when I'm dealing with that guy, it's really all I'm going to do to treat any kind of penetration to my chest, okay? When I'm dealing with that guy and he's on the boat and he's waiting, the first thing I need to do is let EMS know that my casualty has a spear through his chest and it can't come out. So that's gonna affect how they, like what they plan for their rescue guys to come out because this dude is not gonna fit in a basket. You know, they may need to bring like a different kind of jungle penetrator as we call it, like something he can sit on to go up if he's still conscious and able to move. Or they, you know, may, they're gonna have to reassess how they get the guy off your boat if you're out on the water. So just make sure they know. And then also with that, when he's hanging out in her boat after you've treated him, have the wounded side down so that any bleeding that he's got going on in here isn't going to the other side and causing issues with his own lung. Um, one thing you can do, especially because we're in the water, is one, you need your face down near this. You're not gonna hear anything, but you can, if you get really close to it, the guy's gonna be wet. You might see some bubbling from like blood and water and all that, that if, if you see that bubbling, it means it's not fully sealed, so you can throw another one on. Uh, everybody has Ziploc bags and everybody has duct tape, and that's all you need to make an inclusive dressing. So if I didn't look these up, they're probably not super expensive. I mean, the most expensive part of this kit that I saw when I was searching most of these products for 40 bucks, you could do these with duct tape and any kind of plastic. I mean, even the plastic that this thing comes on would work, but you guys just gotta think, whatever duct tape you use, one, it's gonna take longer to put on than this, and two, Make sure that duct tape works when it's wet. It's a lot of duct tape out. So I would recommend just buying these guys. They look super cheap. Um, Amazon has most of this crap. So if a dude had that penetrating injury to his chest and I've sealed it, I've done all I can. Now I just got to get him out of here. That's really it. What can happen is it's going to show in the following slides here. He's got a penetration to the left side of his chest. As he breathes, his lung over time is going to start getting smaller and smaller. Do those things stick to blood? Yeah, they'll stick to like anything. They are ridiculously sticky. I put them on a, a patient who is completely covered. You want to wipe it off if you can, but you know, wipe it off as best you can. But I would have no concern that if I pulled somebody out of the water and they were soaking wet, had wetsuit lube and blood on them, that I could like wipe them once, probably with just my hand, and get it to stick. And if not, like most of us have like microfiber cloth somewhere on our boat to clean our crap off. So if at first if that doesn't work, I mean, I'm not talking about even cleaning it. Just wipe it and then stick it because you don't want air to get in there. I think it was also Three Kings was the movie where the guy started having the lung issue and they did a needle decompression to him. They stuck the needle in his chest to fix the problem. So it's not really how it works in real life, but that's how you, you solve that problem is basically you stick a needle in to the affected side to relieve pressure. Um, I've got a couple of them over there. We can open one and I can show you, but we're not really gonna teach it in this class because like sticking a three inch needle into people's chest is not something we can just do in a you know, PowerPoint stand up class while we're drinking beer. So. Is that like a 16 gauge? <laughs> All right, so this is what, this is a gunshot wound. Again, this was a video before and what you'll see is, uh, what is that called, it's pearl sack? Yep. Okay, so his pleural sac inside that surrounds his lungs is actually flapping in the video when he breathes in, but when he breathes out, it's just the way the way the membrane is, it like closes up so it doesn't let the air back out. Yep. 
Hey, yeah, they're called a sucking chessman because you will hear that sound if it's big enough. It'll definitely, you'll hear them suck in, you'll hear it like flopping around because it's moist and bloody. So this, the picture's kind of crappy, but you can see that the guy's inhaling right now. And this is the same wound that's been treated with an occlusive dressing, and it's gonna suck in on it. Another way of doing this, uh, in the past, they used to leave one side open when they taped it, so that the guy could breathe in, it, it like closes it to his chest, but when he breathes out, it allows air to escape. I don't know if they're doing it on, on your side anymore, but we don't do it in the field because it's there's too much of a risk for it to open and transport. So it's, it's better on our side to just close it completely. All right, so this is just an example of a needle, uh, what a thor what it calls, thoracentesis needle looks like. Basically a three and a half inch long needle that you jam in, insert, uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> in the costal space, <laughs> and when you pull the needle out, it's just got a catheter that stays in there, and it allows them to breathe out. A lot of times you can put your ear on it and actually hear their chest depressurize. But it's definitely not like the movie where it was this loud gushing, Bring a wall of air. Okay, so tension you with thorax is I think one of the biggest causes of death when people get shot in this region and it remains untreated. They're not actually bleeding out, but they're not actually like, have, they are having the inability to breathe, but they're having the inability to breathe because you just opened up a vacuum and all you have to do is close it to fix it. So again, any kind of penetrating injury to include shark bite, you don't know how long that guy's teeth were. He could have definitely penetrated that sack. So if you got if you got bit here, freaking get plastic over all of that. And I would probably do a lot of small pieces rather than a big one so that we can make sure you have a good seal. Um, it's super easy to treat. It's literally like you guys don't even need a rep of this. It's just put plastic on skin or cut plastic and put around spear and then you're good. Just make sure you secure the spear too. Like if he's getting up and you're having to transport him. We've all seen the pictures of Spiro that's like in the hospital after they got shot in the butt or shot in the nose. Like I couldn't find any good pictures of somebody with one in their chest. Probably because nobody knew what to do and they didn't want to post the, the after photo. But uh, all you have to do is make sure that that doesn't start rubbing on that dressing and open it up. So both lung and heart function get impaired with this. Uh, if you start seeing the guy's trachea or jugular vein popping out or the trachea pulling to one side, you're probably too late in this regard. You should jump on the, the radio and tell him to hurry the hell up because that, that means that like his, this lung is like pulling super hard and his whole body is like fighting it with every bit that he's got for air. More examples of how it goes in. Uh, if you got, this is a super easy technique to learn, and it is something that if somebody got a penetration to the chest and it took an aircraft more than 30, 45 minutes to get to, you might have to do. Um, it's definitely easy to learn. It's called the needle thoracostomy, I believe. Uh, we call it needle D, and that, that needle's like nine bucks on Amazon. You get it from North American Rescue. You're literally pushing a needle in above a rib. You just have to know how to find the right rib. You're probably not going to kill the guy, even unless you like, you know, even if you stuck in the center of the chest. Just look it up on your own. It's very helpful, but we don't have time to really get into like super advanced stuff like that. But if I wasn't showing each person how to do it, you know, they wouldn't be really grasping it. Is it possible to do that for all? So it is, but uh, there's two places. This is the primary look. Well, actually, down here would be the primary location. Even if I went towards the heart, I'm not very likely to hit it, but you still can. There's a slide on here that shows all the bad stuff in this area that you don't want to hit. But the method that we recommend, like when we're doing it under night vision at night, is you put the patient's hand under their arm to use as their own measuring device. You find the rib that's right there and you just go on top of it. And you're very unlikely to hit anything critical by coming in here, which works on you know anybody that's not like morbidly obese. So that's the only time you're going to have to like push in and go to the top. Um, again, you're going back towards the vertebra, and not towards the mediastinum. You're you're going straight in if you're coming from the side, over the top of the rib. Right, but in other words, not towards the mediastinum. Yeah. So English. this is what you've got all down in here, but you don't want to hit. So that's why I'm not going to teach <laughs> this without having the ability. I mean, I didn't know I had three other medical people here, but. Without being able to demonstrate it and actually like stick it in on like a dummy, it's not worth teaching. But it's super easy. You can probably go you know Google it or YouTube it and have an idea. And 
again, if you take any kind of basic trauma class, they'll probably get to this point. Um, so what they're doing here is they're doing it way too high on his chest. Okay, so, sorry, I know that's kind of grody. Um, the other thing that we might encounter is if somebody gets penetrated or lacerated down in their belly, a lot of pressure holding your guts in. So just about every time I've ever seen somebody with anything happen down here, all their stuff comes outside. Um, it's super gross, but it's not necessarily like life or death. But what you can do if you do run into this scenario is clean it off with fresh water, not salt water, because you might cause some kind of osmotic issue since like everything in your body works on that. Clean it off with fresh water and just cover it with plastic. Don't. They're t they used to teach us to like try and rip the skin back and like shake it in. Now it's basically, if it looks like you could do like one little thing and put it back in, put it back in. If not, just cover it with a wet dressing after you clean it. And just make sure that it's not gonna like, you're gonna try and put them in a basket and that gets hooked on something and he goes up and that stays there. Cause that'll be bad. Okay. So once you, once you put like a covering on that, don't apply a whole lot of pressure to it. Definitely secure it to his body, but don't apply a whole lot of pressure to it because his bodily function, function still need to move through that. Um, so, secondary assessment, once you're done, head and toe, treat as you go and expose the patient as needed. What's the diagnosis there? Okay, so, you know, anything else that could penetrate you, we talked about like the chest stuff. You don't need to put an occlusive dressing if you have a penetration to your leg, but there's a very good chance that you may encounter somebody who, again, was trying to give Jimmy a fish and just jammed it into his leg. If he hasn't pulled the knife out yet and it's in more than like that far, I would leave it and make it a big deal and secure it to his leg in the position it's in. So what, they may have already started working on this person. I'm not gonna say they did anything wrong, but if that was lower on her body, like there should be one an occlusive dressing from my level of training. Maybe if these guys saw it, they'd be like, oh, it's low enough, it's not a big deal. I would instantly put an occlusive dressing on that, and then I would somehow use maybe Sam splint material, which is like a foldable splint that you've probably seen people walk around with, like a, you can mold it to any shape, to make some kind of device that would allow that to be stable. Because what you guys think, gotta think about is if we get injured on a boat, we're getting helicopter lifted out of there, or carried across deck, to a, a boat that's bigger than us, and if a boat is bigger than us, because those cutters are pretty big, they're probably gonna be rocking at a different rate. So it's gonna be a, a hairy scenario lifting that guy over the deck. So you want it secured. Um, more so for the legs, there's a gap. Just to add on to that, a lot of times if you're doing like improvised medicine, which we will be doing, you can take a t-shirt or a towel and, and twirl it into a spiral, and so then make a donut around whatever is in it. Someone and then take that. That's a really good way to see it. I also can teach your classes. I've never heard of that one. That's awesome. Yeah, no, that's that's like I've just like stuck stuff around it, but that would be a way quicker method of doing it. Um, so I think that's the last actual medicine piece in this. Yeah. So for the overview, uh, we'll talk about the items um, that I think everything in red there is what I believe that you should absolutely have in your first aid kit. So the first one is the tourniquet, which is still going around. They're 40 bucks and they can save your life and they're super fast and you can do it with one hand. There's nothing else that you have on your boat that you can apply to yourself one hand other than a professional, you know, produced template. Um, pressure dressings are another one. I'm not gonna mess with this one because this is brand new and I mean, I'll mess with that when, when we look at these over here, but I'm not gonna try and embarrass myself in front of you. I haven't seen how this one works yet, but again, it doesn't have to be a pressure dressing. You could probably get away with like, I would say four to six of these little gauze packets would be good for an individual first aid kit. You know, maybe more, they're super small. So I would say four to six. Uh, duct tape is like a mandatory item. If you're worried about size, you could take the duct tape off the roll and do what we do because we have to make everything small for our packs and just like fold it over on itself and then roll it up. And then you can get, you don't have the big old two inch circle in the center of the duct tape, now you've got duct tape that is like way smaller, but you still have like 15, 20 feet of it. Um, <coughs> plastic bag and then gauze, hemostatic and regular. Not sure what the hemostatic gauze costs. At a minimum, have four to six bags of the regular. 
Other things you can add if you get the training on them is the MPA and the needle D. The MPA is a tube you can put in somebody's nose to open up their airway if they're unconscious, prevents their tongue from falling back. Uh, like, you know, when you're unconscious, you're not controlling the muscles as much. Prevents their tongue from falling back. And also, if they got like facial burns, like some dude that had never been on a boat, he sparked up a cigarette while he was sitting on the gas cap in my boat last night. And I'm like, dude, what are you, have you never been on a boat? Like, some people don't know that. You know, he could have blown that. I just filled the boat, just pulled away. I don't have blowers because it's a small boat. Could have blown the boat up. So, you know, anything can happen. You should know how to use an MPA and a needle, uh, needle D at like a basic level. They're super easy. Um, to reassess this real quick before I demo a couple of these things, treatment overview. Move the casualty somewhere safe. Treat in the order of precedence. Bleeding comes before airway, comes before respiration, which would be like that sucky chest movement. Uh, so they're actually here on the slide. Passive hemorrhaging, airway, respiration, and other visible injuries. You see guts hanging out, it's like the last, least important thing. You, you really don't even need a cover, as long as they don't fall off when he goes in the airplane, you know, or the helicopter. The most important thing is bleeding, making sure the guy's able to breathe. So that's all you need to think about. Stop the bleeding, start the breathing is the way that, you know, we kind of drill it into our heads. And then reassess the guy constantly and conduct contact the EMS as soon as possible. Um, the pressure dressings and the tourniquets need a, need a quick demo. Um, so I'll grab them and bring them over here and we can demo them. But does anybody have any questions before we get into that? I don't want to take a long time. Slides available on the website. I emailed them to Mario. Where can you go? Yeah, I can post them if it's okay with you. Uh, let me clean them up, make sure that like, there's nothing that you know might someone have yelled before. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. At least this one, this one might probably be more than this one. Yeah. So there's gonna be it'll take me ten minutes to clean them up. Um, I'll, I'll send them to Mario again, cleaned up, and then I'll be good. Um, so real quick. Oh, you had a question. So I'm, I'm just gonna emphasize a couple things. The most important thing is just to stop the bleeding. Out of this whole uh, awesome brief. So he covered like two weeks of content in like two in an hour or whatever it was. Um, I would buy two uh, tourniquets because you, if you're in that type of situation, you you might need more than one. So it's always good to have two. And plus, if you're a piece like him, you break the one, you break the windlass, and you might need the second one to, to reapply. If you put a bunch of this dressing in and it's all bloody, and you're thinking, ah, I want some new dressing to soak up more blood, don't pull out the old dressing because that'll break it the cloth that's formed and you'll have to start all over with their bleeding process. So just leave the stuff that's there and pack more on top of it. Um, you were talking about like if you have a femoral vein bleed, I don't know if you guys use junctional tourniquets. If you guys, I've never, I've never even got to touch them. If you really want to geek out on tourniquets, you can go buy a junctional tourniquet too. Basically, that's the junction between your, your abdomen and your lower extremity. And that'll apply pressure really well to like your femoral vein specifically, which is right in the groin. If you don't care, just buy the two regular tourniquets, and that's that should be. Your point about breaking them. Uh, there's a lot of plastic ones out there, so I don't know where you get the aluminum one. Yeah, so it's this one that's that's floating around here is called the Soft T. It's uh, one of the new like standard that they're trying to switch everybody to. They're actually pulling all the other plastic ones out of the military, so they're the, the, the metal ones are available on Amazon. So I guess what I would say is when you're looking them up. Just make sure that the one you're buying has a metal windlass. It'll probably be in the description as like something that they're advertising for it because plastic ones are known to be crappy. Um, there's also one that's out there that has like a set screw looking thing on it. Uh, it's an old version of the soft tee. If you buy the soft tee, do not buy the one with a set screw on it because you're absolutely not going to be able to function that yourself if you need to. The turn is nearly impossible to put on your own body. Yeah, um. <clears throat> I'm not that I tend to use a more surgical tape. Okay. Yeah, if it holds and it's airtight, then surgical tape usually it's got a little hole. Oh, okay. Um, then I don't know if it would be the best for an occlusive dressing, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with. I, I want to say Gorilla tape is probably the best that I've seen as far as like stickiest duct tape I've seen. Definitely don't get the military issue stuff because it's like lowest bitter. Like it touches one thing and it'll never stick to anything else again. With the black gorilla tape, is, is pretty awesome. I can't attest to how well it is with like 
blood, because I've never used, I've always used a real loose dressing. But I use it on my boat, and I've never had an issue where water has made it not work. So. You gotta um, use the good electrical tape. What's that? You gotta use like Scotch 88 or Scotch 33 for electrical tape, and you can wrap it over yeah, wet to like so stick it, and you use like an inch and a half. If, if it, I don't, I'm not even gonna speak to like what brands or whatever. If you get it and try it and it sticks to you and it's airtight, I would trust it, you know? Um, well, I just, we use Scotch 88 and water and it, and like no shark, you can just, for everything, just wrap it and wrap it and wrap it and it'll stick to itself here. <laughs> and we made water, waterproof seals with it for electrical stuff. So. Okay, yeah, well, if, if, yeah, if it works. The big thing is gonna be, that I would really recommend is get two of what you're what you're gonna put in your kit and test test it on yourself or your buddy. You know, and make sure that the people who are frequently going on your boat at least know how to use a turn Um what other questions we got? This treatment for shock do you do anything? So with the amount of time that I assess that it would take the Coast Guard to get to somebody out here, I wouldn't say do anything other than keep the guys warm. Because I mean Yes, there's areas where you're not going to be in contact with another boat for a little bit if you have a longer range offshore boat. But I mean, I've got a about a, like I can go 40 miles line of sight offshore in mine. I've never once not had a boat shattering on the radio while I was out there. So I would imagine that I could have somebody out there if it was life or death within an hour or two. Um, I would recommend keeping them as warm as possible. It's a good point because they're going to be super cold in the water as is and you just cut their suit off and they're wet and half the time it's 60 degrees out here and cloudy. So absolutely keep them warm. I just was trying to condense massive hemorrhaging like the most important stuff. Uh, what he asked was like, how are you gonna treat shock while you're waiting on those guys to come? And really the only thing that we really would be able to do unless you know how to give IV fluids and do other things would be keep the guy as warm as possible. So your best bet for that is space blankets because they're like, they fold down like that small. You can wrap the guy up with them. And you know, it's yeah, it's also a big inclusive dressing that gives you more bandage materials. The cool thing with a lot of this stuff is like I can do tons of stuff with this. You know, I can make a splint for my arm, you know, put off for my arm, I can do all sorts of stuff. So really, you know, I had my required items on there, but like gauze and a tourniquet are the two most important things. Duct tape and something to seal an airway or a, a hole in your chest is also right there. But you can always find that in the boat. You know, like you could use a Snickers wrapper if you needed to. So I got a lot of Snickers on the boat. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so any other questions? I'm not rushing anything. I just don't want to keep you guys here. Uh, yeah, so no, one of the things that I would really recommend that you put in with these tourniquets is a couple of sharpies. Not one, but two. This one dries out. Because it's really, really important that you write the time down. A lot of these, a lot of these tourniquets will have little tags on there for the time. It'll say time. Yep. If it doesn't, write it on the guy's limb or put it on his arm, whatever. If you can't, red suit, or you can put it on, write it on the fiberglass of the boat. But it's real important when the EMS shows up and collects a guy that he knows what time. Whoever the scribe is, whoever's taking down medical notes and stuff like that, give him the time because depending on the amount of time that that tourniquet's on his limb, is going to make a big difference. Or slight, at least a slight difference in how the medical professionals at the at the ER treat that wound, because after a couple hours, the procedures change a little bit. So that can make a big difference whether or not they save that limb or save the life. So I would at least put a, I would put at least two two sharpies on in case one drives out. You got another one. No, thank you. That's a super good point. Um, there's actually tourniquets on or, or sharpies on the table over there, but I completely missed it. So thank you. Um, yeah, what they tell us is if the tourniquet isn't doesn't have one of the little white tags that says time, just write it on their forehead, you know, or like he said, anywhere on the boat. But just make sure it goes with the guy, because if you write it on your boat and don't pass it to the EMS crew, they have no idea. Anybody else got anything to add or any questions? Okay, so real quick, I want to make everybody get up and move, so I'll try and do it standing up as best as I can. Um, let me grab one more turn. You know what? I don't think there's any good way to do it standing up. Why don't we all just grab our beers and cruise over to this corner here so I can put some uncomfortable pressure on our friend here. <laughs> Welcome to our first meeting. I didn't even sign a waiver.
It's got a clip on it. We never unclip. We just leave them prepped, big enough to put over a leg, and then you can like fold it up. And I don't even keep rubber bands on mine because the, the idea is if like you're the one that's hurt, you can just open it and put your arm in. You don't want to be taking crap off of your teeth and stuff like that. Um, so you prep it big enough that you wouldn't have an issue getting it on somebody's leg. And if this guy, I just got him pulled into my boat. Just go ahead and lay down. On the table. I don't think that one. <laughs> this one we just tried to move and it wouldn't move. Are hey, you guys gonna get mad if we jump up on this table? Yeah. Okay. So don't break the table. Um, just lay down. We'll, we'll have everybody poke their head over and they'll be able to see it. Okay. So inside your leg, your femoral gets pretty accessible right in here. Okay. Are you gonna give me sexual harassment charges? Okay. <laughs> so, if I came up to him and I had to apply pressure to him and I wasn't freaking out, I can stop his bleeding just by getting my fingers down in here, okay? But if I was trying to do other stuff, if I'm doing this, I can't apply a tourniquet. So if I come up to him, <laughs> if I come up to him and it's this leg I'm working on, I'm gonna put pressure, you need to move your giblets? <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna put pressure right there and that's gonna be enough to allow me to work this tourniquet on his leg. And understand that I have time now because I'm putting pressure on his leg, so I don't need to freak out with this tourniquet. Okay, I can work it up, I can get it up as close to my knee as I can, and then I'm just going to tighten this guy down as much as I can. As soon as I'm ready, I'm going to start tightening this guy down. All right, I'm not going to get you so tight that your pulse actually stops. <laughs> Okay, and then basically when I'm tight enough and I think that the bleeding has stopped or he no longer has a pulse in his leg, I throw that up there and lock it down. Now, look at all this space that I wasted by having my leg there. So that could have been a lot higher. If I have a second person that knows how to do this, I can get way up high and I can work that tourniquet way up higher, which is going to be more effective and safer for long-term care. So think about that. If you have to do it alone, that's how you do it, but your knee space is lost. Giblets. You have buddies. Yeah. You can get real high. Can you put the second turn kit higher than the first? Like you could if you.